Hi, welcome back to Door County Gardening. Once again, I'm your host, Brett Hansen, and I'm very happy to be here with you today to talk about native plants and native plant landscaping and gardening. But before we begin with these two extremely qualified, wonderful Door County Master Gardeners, I want to remind everyone that one of our goals here at Door County Gardening is to feature Door County experts, the people in our community who have learned how to grow and adapt their plants and gardens in this environment over years of experience. So hopefully each month we will feature an expert from our area. This week it is experts on native plants. And next month we will be featuring experts in beekeeping, the co-presidents of the Door County Beekeepers Club. So thanks again for showing up and please make sure you pass the word and let other people know. And if you don't feel like liking or subscribing or any of those things, I'll live, but it would certainly help the podcast out a lot. So let's get to it. Let's hear about native plants in Door County from the people who really know. Although it might seem relatively new, the native plant movement has been building for many decades. And I guess we should say it's as old as plants before we, you know, got in the way. Fortunately, this week we are lucky to have two Door County Master Gardeners who are also native plant experts, Karen Newburn and Chris Dobner. Welcome to the show, everyone. Now, before I start asking a lot of questions, we'd really love to hear more about your background and philosophy on native plants and gardening in general. So Chris, why don't you get us started? Okay, my background is really in education. I was a special educator in the county for 37 years or something like that. I got interested in um, native plants just from loving being outside and, and going to different parks and things like that and seeing the plants. And so I joined in 1991, I joined Wild Ones at that time, there was no wild ones in Door County, so I joined the Green Bay chapter. And we did a lot of plant rescues, and that was really interesting. And um, then when they, they organized uh, wild ones in Door County, I did join that and have been a member of that since then. Then I also joined um, the Door County Master Gardeners in 1997 and have been very um, active in that organization as president, as charge of our plant sale, uh, the garden door, and many of the committees. So, and I've gone to a lot of conferences, and always my main interest has been with native plants in the natural um, world. Chris, did you say plant rescues? Yes. They used to do in Green Bay, um, they used to rescue native plants, mainly when they were building and so they were going to destroy. You'd go to these places and there'd be these big, beautiful new houses with just lawns and some spindly little trees held up by stakes. And then right to the side, there'd be this gorgeous woods with every kind of, you know, native woodland plant you'd want, want to see. And they were going to destroy that. So they would let us come in and dig plants and bring them to our homes and gardens. And plant oh, them cool. there. So yeah, that was it was yeah. really interesting. The plant rescuers. That sounds like a podcast in itself, you know. Well, yeah, but whole it, series. It's, it's, there's controversies with that too in doing it. Um, yeah. but there we did mostly, like I said, where it was going to be destroyed. We once did went down to Oshkosh to a um by the hospital there. They were going to uh make a they had planted a prairie, uh Neil Dibol and um, Prairie Nursery had planted it for them. And they were going to expand their parking lot because they were expanding the buildings. So they were just going to cement over it. So they let us go in and dig all the plants we wanted. It was quite an experience. It was a rainy day and I took my sister with me who is no way, shape or form a gardener. <laughs> <laughs> she was not happy well, with the mud. And... <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Well, hopefully you hooked her. What about you, Karen? Well, I... um. I've been interested in plants ever since I was a little girl. My mom was, I grew up on a farm and my mom was really into wildflowers. And um, then when I, I went to college, I started out, I was going to be a game warden, but then I realized that 
probably wasn't a great angle. So I went into, um, I studied to become a naturalist. And so for about 30 years, I did education programming, first down in Northeast Iowa, and then I moved up to Door County in 2000 to work at the Ridges Sanctuary. And so I was doing education programs, hikes, and teaching people about not just plants, but that's always been kind of my, my biggest interest. And uh, so in 2014, I left the Ridges, and I was lucky enough to land at um, door Landscape and Nursery, which is up in Carlsville. Uh, it's a landscape company, but we specialize in using native plants. So I had a chance to, uh, I had to kind of change my thinking a little bit. And instead of just talking about those native plants in their natural habitat, I had to try to translate how do you put that into your home garden or your home landscape. Uh, so I've been doing that for about 10 years. I'm the nursery manager there, and we just do everything that we can to to promote the use of natives um, in in home landscapes, some commercial properties as well. And uh, I've done a little bit of plant rescuing too, not a not a lot, but I have a few wildflowers in my front yard that came from a property where some trails were going to be developed, and they were you know, going to dig up all of these things anyway. So they came and now they're living happily in my front yard. Yeah. I, I've always wanted to go do plant rescues, but my wife said no, because it looked to her like stealing, but I know you two had permission, but if I snuck in in the middle of the night, I don't think the neighbors <laughs> would consider that plant rescue. So right, right. yeah, that's, that's wonderful. So um, let, let's talk a little bit about the benefits of native plant gardening. And remember we want this to be, um, understandable for the beginner, like me, I'm a relative beginner when it comes to native plants, but don't, don't hesitate to add some, um, you know, advanced information as well. But let's start off with a little bit of benefits of plant gardening, native plant gardening for a beginner. Okay. Well, I think that, um, kind of to step even back a, a bit from that, I think that a lot of our, what we consider a typical home landscape is pretty much an ecological desert. There's, if you have a big expanse of lawn and like Chris was saying, a few little trees here and there, maybe some uh, potted annuals up by the front doorstep, that's not providing much habitat for insects, butterflies, birds, uh, squirrels, any kind of wildlife. And so I think that one of the biggest benefits of using native plants in the landscape is to provide some of those habitat benefits uh, food and shelter for, you know, we all like to see butterflies and we like to have birds in our yard, but a lot of people don't realize that what you plant or don't plant uh, can really affect that. So if we want to see more wildlife and be able to enjoy butterflies and so on, um, we need to use the plants that they they are familiar with that they can use. Now, I would say too that these plants have developed in this area for many, many years. And so they are used to the climates. You know, here we have, we go from freezing in the winter to hot in the summer and a lot of snow cover at times and not so much at other times. These plants have developed with that kind of background and they've also developed with the insects and, and the um, animals in this area. And that makes them um, a better choice because you don't need to do as much fertilizing you don't need and you don't need pesticides because you want those insects to be in your garden because that's what you're doing is developing habitat and like i've had a prairie now for gosh almost 30 years and i've never fertilized it the only thing we used to do is burn we haven't done that recently which degrades the prairie somewhat but you know, I haven't put pesticides on it. I've done some herbicides because, because of the way our um, environment is now, we get in invasive plants. And so you do have to do some dealing with that. But your native plants don't need as, as long as you put them, you know, it's still the same garden thing as the right plant in the right area. I'm in a very wet area. I live basically in the black ash swamp. And so you can't put plants that like dry, sandy soil. They're not gonna grow, you know, no matter what. You have to fit your plants, whether native plants or not, you have to fit them to your soil and light conditions and all those regular garden uh, um, aspects. So- And if, 
if, say like with the invasive species, the garlic mustard that's everywhere here in Door County. I mean, is that is it worth the removal of the garlic mustard to use some kind of uh, herbicide or something to kill it? I have a lot of it around some other bushes. Like the, I have this wonderful mock orange bush and next to some, uh, uh, um, a dogwood and, and another bush and the birds just love it. So I, I dig up the garlic mustard at the bottom. I'm very hesitant to spray anything. That's where the birds eat. I mean, should I just keep digging it up? It kind of depends on your plant. Garlic mustard, you can pull and dig. But if you get into canary reed grass and um, phragmites, that you, you know, you can't dig that up and pull it. Um, you'd probably have to use some kind of heavy duty equipment to do it. But so you might have to, I know, you know, with like phragmites, they tie it up, cut it off, and then they treat it with so that they're not spraying all over the place because you don't want to do that. You want to protect the insects and things that are around. But there are yeah. some plants you try and dig them and the roots just keep coming back anyway. So yeah. It depends I think you on can think plant. of herbicides as herbicides can be thought of as a tool. You know, it like Chris was saying, some plants invasives you can get rid of by pulling. You may have to do it for five or six or seven years, but you can get ahead of them and rid of them eventually. But there's some instances and and conservation agencies use herbicide carefully uh, and judiciously in certain instances because that's the only way to get rid of um, get rid of some of our invasives. And some of it has to do too with you know how much labor and how much time do people want to invest. If you want faster results, for instance, if you decide you're going to put in a prairie. Uh, yes, you could kill all the existing vegetation with herbicides, and then you're going to be able to get in there and start planting faster. Or you can take less uh, aggressive approaches that might take a little more time. Um, so it's, it, you know, the answer is, as it often is, it depends. Yeah, that's what I'm learning as a gardener. I've been, I, I'd say I've been a gardener since we moved to this property, um, you know, five years at the most. I garden a little bit at our old house, but that at first I wanted simple answers. I just wanted things, I do it and I don't have to mess with it again. And I finally settled into the uh, slightly more patient relationship with nature. And I just, it, everything's always changing. I mean, I knew that everywhere else. I don't know why I thought it wasn't gonna happen in the garden, but um, you just gotta relax and do the best you can and roll with it, so. And then for watering, that's another thing. Like um, I had to water a lot last year because of how dry it was. I have a little over an acre with lots of gardens. Um, I have been told that native plant gardening requires less watering. Does that turn out to be true? I think it does. I mean, I have the prairie out there and it's uh, four acres or something like that. There's no way I can water that. And so it, I haven't watered it at all and it does fine without any water. Yeah. And even in my garden where there's native plants, I don't water much, where I might have to go and water some of the uh, other plants that I have that are non-native plants. I think a lot of it, you know, once they're established, most natives are very drought tolerant. They, you know, some of those prairie plants have roots that go six, seven, 10 feet into the ground. So they're gonna be able to tap into deeper water sources where our shallow rooted well, lawns, for example, which might have two or three inches of roots, you know, the surface of the soil dries out and they're doomed where a prairie drop seed plant is going to be sucking water from much deeper and is going to be able to survive. But a lot of like most garden plants, getting them established, you might have to do some supplemental watering just to get them going. Once they're set, they're, they are not completely maintenance free, but pretty close. Yeah. Well, I, I'm getting a little bit older. I mean, I, I, I'm, I turned 55 a few days ago and I love gardening, but it's starting to have more of an effect, especially on my back. So I, I have a feeling that over the next 10 years, I'm going to slowly be transforming some of my gardens into something more like native plant gardening. And I have a couple that I want to talk about later, but um, mm -hmm. what about the contemporary issues with native plant gardening? I mean, we know th these plants have been around for centuries, for ages, for eons, and but now we have these contemporary issues like climate change and invasive species. What role does native plant gardening have on some of these contemporary issues? Especially well, climate change. You know, we talked before about how these native plants have evolved in our climate, in our soil conditions, 
they're probably going to be able to weather climate change better. Certainly, there's going to be some changes, um, you know, as the temperatures get warmer. But, um, you know, I think that natives overall are going to be able to cope with that better. Um, I'm not sure what other be, issues. There's going to be some plants that are going to, you're going to lose, and other plants will take over and, and, and survive. So it kind of depends on just how severe the climate change is. Also, because your native plants are open pollinated, meaning they seed and, and can continue to grow, they can make changes. A lot of your non-native garden plants are clones. And yeah. if it's a clone, it means it does not seed itself. It's growing from tissue culture and root thing um, culture, that kind of thing. So it can't change with the climate because it is what it is. And so your um, open seeded, you know, open pollinated plants have a better chance to survive. Right. So since we're talking about that anyways, like with invasive species last year, I, I'm not sure if I have the name of the pest correct, but I call them Japanese beetles, the little things that they've been getting worse each year. Last mm -hmm. year, they were just I mean, I was constantly fighting them on my roses. I have about, I don't know, 25, 30 rose plants in, a, in an area. And that was, one day it was just, they just overwhelmed me. I was out there, you know, with the bags and the squeezing and everything. And I, I so are there any native plants that you know of that repel or, or that those kind that it, Japanese beetles don't like, or that would help my roses? Or is it just, I'm going to have to go with some kind of spray? Well, with Japanese beetles, you can spray them, but the sprays aren't terribly effective. Um, I was at a program at the Green Bay Botanical Garden a few years ago, and we asked them, you know, how do you deal with them? And they have staff that go out with buckets of soapy water, and they knock all of the Japanese beetles they can find into this soapy water. They die. Um, it's certainly not going to get rid of all of them, but... Um, Japanese beetles do have certain favorites, and also the number of Japanese beetles really depends on weather conditions year to year. Um, last year actually was not a bad year, I think, in my experience, but there have been years when they've been a lot worse, and it depends on rainfall and temperatures and, and all of that kind of thing, and I can't remember the details. Um, but there is going to be some years that are bad and some that aren't. Um, because they're Japanese beetles, they came from Asia, it may be that certain of our natives are not as tasty to them. Yeah. So there's probably a benefit to that, sure. Well, I just need to tell you, Karen, the reason why you didn't have a very hard time because all your Japanese beetles were at my house. They were all at your my house? Roses, yeah, I, were. Have, I don't okay. have hardly any, but then I don't have roses, and yeah. that's one of their favorites. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah. I love my roses. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm go this summer, I'm going to be out there ready from the beginning. I'm gonna, I think I might sleep in the rose garden if I have to with you know, <laughs> night vision goggles or something, but we'll see. Yeah, so the, the, the invasive species issue is a, is a tough one. Um, I have... You know, I listen to everything that people listen to, and I really, really love the pollinators. I, I keep bees. Last year, we had more and more. Well, the year before, we had more butterflies, but last year was pretty good, and we had more hummingbird moths. So I'm trying really hard not to damage or poison anything in that regard, but I have to do something about these Japanese beetles this year because it was very frustrating. Um, but so what about the... Um, like the pollinators i know you I, we all know that pollinators like native plants but la so i'll give you just a quick example i planted sunflower so i have a cut garden um I, this, on the other side of my driveway it's eight rows of about 40 you know 40 spots so about 325 places for plants and it's all annuals and then i just redo it it's not very native at all but two years ago i had well, there were days when there were like 40 monarchs they loved it um is is it so my question i want to ask is am i are those butterflies still doing well should i have more natives instead of that or is it okay for me to have that and natives to improve things for pollinators because i really really want those butterflies to come back every year okay yeah you would the thing that your your plants are they're nectaring on those plants but they don't they can't raise their young on those plants. Yeah. Monarch butterflies can only raise their young on milkweed, on Asclepius um, you know, species. 
Yeah, I have about yeah. 30 milkweed plants in the in the whole yard everywhere in other yeah. spots. See, and that's that's that will help. Then you you can have both of them. That's fine to have right. the the nectarine plants as long as you also have some of the host plants. And right. I think Doug Ptolemy said like about 90% of pollinators have at least some specific plants that they need. It might not be just one species like the monarch, but it might be just uh, several species. But most of them are not generalists where they can use anything. Right. And then maybe later at the end, you both of you can give us some suggestions. I, w I want to provide the best plants I can for the pollinators, but I also want my cut flowers. And uh, so I'm going to do both. But um, did you want to add anything to that, Karen? Oh, I just I just wanted to say that, um, you know, non-native plants are not necessarily bad. Many of them are excellent um, nectar flowers. But like Chris was saying, um, the you have to have the natives if you want the, the larval stage, the caterpillars, uh, to have something to eat and grow on. Um, native trees uh, support hundreds of species of uh, larvae, caterpillars of moths and butterflies that then the birds eat. And you don't get that, uh, either the non-native plants aren't a food source to that stage of the insect. They may be for the adults, they may provide lots of pollen and nectar, but if, they're not, if the caterpillars can't find food, you're not gonna have the adult butterflies. Right. And, and if you don't have caterpillars, your birds aren't going to be there because most of your birds, even if they're seed eating birds and that they feed their young caterpillars because they're young in order to grow as fast as they need to grow. They need the protein that comes from caterpillars. So the majority of birds feed their young caterpillars and other insects. And so if you don't have those caterpillars, your bird population is going to fall. Okay. So for the listeners who are like me, who, uh, forget things in 20, 30 seconds. At the end of the program, I'm going to ask both of you again for some specific recommendations on how to help promote the caterpillars. We About three years ago, we had numerous, I'm pretty sure they were monarch caterpillars under the milkweed pods. Uh, I looked them up and it said they were, but last year I couldn't really find any. And we had a lot of milkweed pods and a good number of butterflies. So um, I'll ask you about that again uh, in regards to recommendations on how to promote more caterpillars with native plants. Um, I wanted to ask uh, both of you just your opinion on something. When I was getting ready for this, um, I was doing a little research and next week I'm going to be um, just doing an introduction and review on one of my favorite garden designers, Pete Udolf. And I didn't know before I started researching garden designers that he designed the Millennial Park and the Highline, both of which I have walked and enjoyed very much. But while I was researching, I read an article in the Garden Ecology Lab in which a gardener, one of their head gardeners, a guy named, I think it's a guy, I shouldn't assume, Signe Garnier, wondered how pollinator friendly Udolf's naturalist gardens really are. And he said, on the positive side, there are lots of flowers. The, uh, they flower from early season to late when th you know, things are blooming. And the plants are left standing well into winter, providing some seed and shelter. And then they don't use much pesticides and they try to include native plants as much as possible. But he said on the negative side, their maintenance involves cutting everything to the ground in late winter, which destroys the winter homes of cavity nesting bees and other things that use the stems. And then he also talked about the lack of layering. And I think I know what that meant, but he talked about Udolf's garden is composed mostly of herbaceous perennials and then um, other plants, but not very many trees or large shrubs. So, how, so I, I'm coming. I'm assuming that trees and large shrubs are really impart, important to the native gardening. Does that sound about right? Definitely. Um, like we were saying, some there's. Uh, if you take oaks for example, they're probably the best trees for supporting insects that then support the birds. So, you know, if you're going to plant a tree, plant an oak tree. Uh, but there's a lot of other ones, willows and cherries, uh, basswood, um, maples, all of those, all of those native trees support a huge diversity. I think diversity is the big key there. A, in any planting, the more diversity of plants you have, the more insects and birds and wildlife are going to be able to use that. And if you look at some of the uh, Doug Ptolemy is one who does a lot and talks about 
how many different insects and things that each type of plant supports. And so they have what they call keystone, I think they call them plants, which support a lot of your pollinators and, and your insects and things. So it's good to put some of those plants into your landscape. Is you Doug telling me? All native. Yeah. You know. That's good because I don't have enough money and I couldn't possibly let go of my plants now. I've worked too hard for the last five years. But is Doug Ptolemy, um, is he a, somebody mentioned him. I was talking with, I think it was the woman who runs the door garden club up north. Um, she was, I think she was saying that Doug Ptolemy was working on a beautiful garden up north someplace. Is he a garden designer? Did I get that right? No. No, he's an entomologist. Entomologist. He's, uh, he's at University of Delaware. Oh God, I'm Canada. way off. Yeah, it's somewhere out, it's somewhere east, but yeah, somewhere out on and the east coast. But no, he's an entomologist, and so he's yeah. looking at insects okay, and so then written... the relationships to what birds eat those insects and what plants those insects need to survive. And so that's he's the author of several books. One of them is called "Bringing Nature Home," which I yeah. highly recommend you check out. Uh, he's yeah, kind yeah. of become the 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 guru of yeah. returning yeah. home landscapes to more natural conditions. Yeah, he talks okay. about in his book, I think it's um, bringing, no, that it's bringing nature home. No, I can't remember. But he talks about homegrown national park and how with when we use native, native plants in our landscapes, we could make a huge national park if enough people did it. And um, yeah, he's, he's written, he's also written a book on just on oaks and how mm -hmm. important they are yeah. because they you know they are probably the most diverse plant as far as hosting insects and caterpillars and things so he he has written some very good books and he also has just a uh, article and it's called gardening for life and you can find it online and it's just a very brief um but important information about the importance of insects and that man is if if we keep on the path we're heading without developing more native plants and things that would provide for our insects we're ruining our food chain and it's going to affect us and also yeah. bees bees you know we don't have all the food if we don't have bees yeah yeah and i keep bees i have uh, two hives i'll be splitting and getting more this year but I have been reading more and more that um, we have to be careful that we don't rely too much on the honeybees because there, there, are, there are a lot of honeybees in the United States, but what we really need is the habitat for the native bees, the ground bees and uh, the, the sweat bees and those bees. So that we'll talk about bees on another episode. I really look forward to that. Yeah, because so. <laughs> native bees, native bees are are more efficient pollinators than honeybees. Yeah, I read that. Yeah, that's cases. it's important to remember. So I mean, just because I mean, like I love keeping bees. I love my honeybees, but at the same time, I got to make sure I'm creating habitat for the others. Now we have been talking about all the joys and the wonderful things. What about the challenges? What are some of the challenges of native garden, native plant gardening? Well, I don't know if it's a challenge, but I think some people, as soon as they hear, hear about native landscaping, they think I have to go 100% native and that's the only thing that'll work. And as we've mentioned, combinations of native and non-native can work beautifully too. So, um, you know, if, if you think it's a challenge to convert your whole yard into prairie, you know, that's one issue, but it's not a challenge to, it's not very difficult to get a few native plants and stick them in with your rose bushes or your you know, boxwood hedge or whatever it might be. Um, I think the biggest challenge is just educating people about what natives are all about and and showing them how wonderful they are in the home landscape and how easy they are to take care of. And I think that people have to kind of get a different attitude to some extent about it. It's a, it's a more wild looking if you go more native rather than just putting a few native plants in your in your garden with your other other um regular flowers you know your non-native flowers it makes more a more wild looking not as um cultivated not as manicured is what i should say maybe manicured is a good word i remember my sister brought a woman she knew up to see my 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 garden, not just my prairie, but the garden too. And 
And she said, oh, very interesting. Well, this woman had been on the Green Bay Garden Walk several times, and I had seen her garden. And it was, you know, here's a hosta, and here's a hosta, and here's a hosta, and everything's all cleaned up. And that's not a native garden. And so if you're into that, where everything has to be manicured and, and no, no holes in your leaves and nothing like that, you're going to have a difficult time with native gardening because you want holes in your leaves. If you're encouraging pollinators, you're encouraging, you need to have host plants. And if you have host plants, you're gonna have caterpillars and things chewing on your on your leaves. So you have to learn to accept some of that. And so it's a kind of an attitude kind of a thing that people are, have to learn to do differently. And yeah. I think we have to get over our love affair with lawns you know, yeah, a lawn a lawn provides nothing for pollinators. Even if you let the dandelions grow, you know, this whole idea of no mo may. I think that the the thought behind it is the emotion behind it is great, but just letting your lawn grow for a month and then mowing it for the rest of the year and spraying pesticides on it and watering it and the the huge amount of fertilizing it and fertilize it. We we spend you know we we put much much more water and much much more fertilizer and other chemicals on our lawns in the united states than we do on our agricultural crop fields and people yeah. don't realize that so i think we have to kind of get over this idea that to have a beautiful lawn or a beautiful yard you have to have a big expanse of perfectly weed free lawn um yeah that's i'll get off my soapbox now that's okay <laughs> yeah. i like the soapbox too you know, some reasons maybe to have lawn. If you have kids, they need something to play on. Uh, we have lawn around our house because we burned our prairie and that stays green at the time. That's green at the time you're burning your prairie. So it was kind of a safety thing. So we didn't get fired too close to our log home. But <laughs> yeah, other yeah. than that. I live yeah, right across the street from Little Lake um, in Sturgeon Bay at Sunset Park. And um, I know there, I, I called the city and asked them why and, and um my representative, a very nice woman, she explained to me why they do it, but they mow that once every week and a half or so. And I just watch a couple people drive back and forth and back and forth and back and forth for, I don't know, an hour and a half or so mowing the, the it's like that flat area where they use it as a basin to catch the sediment before it goes down. And I, and I, I want so bad to just go out there and say, you know, if, if we're not going to do anything else, just let the grass grow just something stop mowing it down for animals and i think it is going to be you know definitely maybe when i retire i might try to make that my cause i'm not very political but i would just love to see native plants in that open space and then i mean there's the rest of the park where people there's tons of grass and ton there's the you know the the disc golf course oh, yes. and the and all those things i would just love this one part to be natural but i'm on my soapbox too so yeah. What about yeah. the regulatory hurdles? I I was at the you you guys were probably there or somebody were. I was at the the door at the crossroads when the gentleman from um, Green Bay came up to talk about native plants about a month ago or so, mm -hmm. and people brought up the Sturgeon Bay regulations and how they were changing them, and I I think they said it was you could have like fifty or forty five percent of your property or your yard in Sturgeon Bay native. And then you had to get an, an approval to go beyond that. Does that, do you, either of you know anything about that? That's yeah. That whole ordinance was revised about a year, year and a half or so ago. Um, and yeah, there's, I don't remember the exact percentages, but for the backyard, it's a higher percentage that you can plant native in the front yard. It's less uh, it, I think there's a, I think there's something in there about having like a buffer zone, a mode area around the natural landscaping. It was, um, the city was, the city council was trying to just kind of define a little bit better what a natural lawn, this was what they called it, uh, is. Um, I can tell you right now that my yard doesn't fit those criteria. And, and but but they also and I think a lot of it has to do with newer construction or newer installations. If someone is putting in a prairie in their backyard, you know they have to just get approval on that for the city. I don't think the city is going to deny anybody. Um, but it came about because someone had a complaint about their neighbor's property that they thought looked wild and unkempt and weedy, 
And it was actually a prairie that was in its early stages when they do tend to look kind of unkempt and weedy. Um, yeah. You know, if the neighbors had been educated a little bit more about it before the planting went in, maybe they wouldn't have been uh, upset about it. But um, yeah, if it looks why if it looks too wild, um, people may may complain about it. But the I don't know if any other towns have similar ordinances. I know that the county has like a weed. There's weed regulations to control Canada thistle and and whatever else is on that noxious weed list. But I don't know that any other towns um, or cities have a natural landscaping ordinance. Green Bay does, Madison does, um, a number of other, a lot of other cities do. But I'm not sure about the rest of Door County. Yeah, I just wanted to bring it up in case um, anybody's thinking about it after listening to this, that I mm -hmm. think it was about 50% of, of the I space think it but is. Yeah. Yeah. 50 percent in front and 75 and back but i could be yep. wrong because I, yeah, I know I yeah i know it's four in the back so yeah 50 and 75 might well be that you can look it up on the city's websites easily yeah. enough and, and there are like wild ones has publications that do talk about um making your native planting more acceptable to other people and that there is and they and they have designs now that you can find on on their website for all different kind of areas and different places that where they're designing using native plants. And if people are interested in that kind of thing, they can look them up and find them or come, yeah. you know, like Earth Day, maybe we'll have some of those available. Sure. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is everything is so easy to find on the internet, but I will put a link into Wild Ones and some of the other organizations that we've mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. So we just have a, a couple more components and I think we'll, cover the your practical tips and resources before we get to the example garden just in case people don't want to hear about my gardens <laughs> hopefully they'll stick around for that too but um what practical tips would you offer to people um both i mean not necessarily people who want a full prairie because they're going to go investigate and research and all that but just for people who want to Imp uh, increase the number of natural native plants that they put in there. Where could they, where should they put them? Do they have to worry about things like watering? I mean, of course we have to watch, watch out for sun, but I mean, how, how, how careful do they have to be about watering and soil and things like that? And then your favorite watering, plants. Watering shouldn't be a, a problem with most of your native plants once you get them established. Uh, soil, it depends again about the plant. It's like any plant. You can't take a plant that comes from the woodland and put it out in the sun. You can't take a plant that is, was developed in a sandy prairie soil and put it in like I have heavy clay. It's not going to survive. And, yeah. and if you um, plants from, from wet areas, if you put them in a real dry area, they're going to have a problem even if you water them because there's, it, there's just differences in the soil and in, in the um, plants around them it, and it makes a big difference. I think if people start by uh, learning about what's native to Door County or what's native to their area, uh, go on land trust hikes, go and hike around at crossroads, go to Chris's prairie and see what she's got planted there. <laughs> um, and and I, I might mention too, prairies technically are not native to Door County, but no, prairie plants, many, many prairie plants grow beautifully up here. So when you're talking about, you know, what's a native plant, yeah, well, maybe it's not native to Door County, but if it does well here, and I figure if it provides some kind of benefit to pollinators or birds or whatever, uh, it's okay. Um, but just take some time to learn. Um, I, I, got a, I got an email from someone this past week saying they had seen this particular wildflower on a, on a hike and wanted to know if, if I knew where we could, where they could buy them. And so, you know, if you see something you like on a, in a natural area in Door County, do a little bit of digging, a little bit of investigating and see if uh, there's a source for it. And there are uh, quite a few reputable sources for native, native plants out there. Um, so if you've got your eye on something, take a look around and see if someone and, and see if you have the right conditions for it, as Chris was saying, as far as water and soil and uh, sun or shade. Yeah, I just want to make sure it's perfectly clear. Karen did not mean for you to go literally digging, going out and digging up those plants. <laughs> she needs I realized to do some research. That. 
Yep. Yeah. As soon as it came out of my mouth, I thought that yep. was a port. It was no, no, it wasn't a port. It was a perfect <laughs> opportunity for a little bit of humor. Um, so yeah. And I'll add to that. If you're interested in that, I have this. You, some of you maybe already have it, but I have this wonderful free app called Plant Net, and it's uh, the first free plant identification app that I think works really, really well. I, I love it. It's great. You can get it for free and download it. And then when you're on those walks, not only will it organize the photos that you take, but it'll tell you with a certain percentage of likelihood what type of plant is it is, and you can identify by the leaves or the flowers and other things. It's great. I love it. I spend way too much time looking at it. <laughs> so now, of course, the part of the show that everybody's been waiting for, the example garden, and I will volunteer to tell you about a couple spaces that I want to go a little more native. Um, the first one, which I want to do more, and I've already bought some plants, and I hope I didn't make big mistakes. I have a garden about, um, it's about 65 feet long, and it's about six, I'm sorry, about 10 feet to the center of the spruce trees with another four feet on the other side of the spruce. There are these three big spruce trees that were here when we bought the property, and um, I put down cardboard and, and, and killed off the grass. And now I've got some plants and I would love your recommendations on how I can try to stay as native as possible. It is um, shaded mostly because the spruce, especially the, it, the, it gets sun for about four hours in the af late afternoon and then through into the evening for the sunset. And I've got those three spruce trees and the plants that I was hoping to plant there and I'm not sure if this is a good idea. I have other places where I could put them. I, ha I bought some, I got some Christmas for Xmas ferns, Christmas ferns, some royal ferns. And I'm not sure if I'm saying this right. Some Hoshera and some Astibi. And I already planted some beach grass in there. Does that seem like a decent combination? Or should I get some of that stuff out of there and do something else? The royal fern usually likes wet. Right. Like some more moist soils. So I would I don't know how well that would do in there. Um, the Christmas fern should be fine. That likes fairly dry. And and chances are your soil might be a little bit acidic with all those spruce needles on it if yeah. the trees have been there for a while. Um a still bee probably will do fine in there. Might need a little bit of supplemental watering to get them established. Okay. Yeah. You could, if you wanted some flowering plants, you could try like a wild geranium. I'm not sure how good they do with the evergreens, since mm -hmm. I don't have much many evergreens. Um, and and bloodroot will grow where it's drier. Again, I'm not sure with the evergreens how it will do. What about um, lilies of the valleys? That will that be okay Maybe. there? No. <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> no, just the lilies of the valley can be very invasive. They'll just keep spreading and spreading and spreading. And I mean, they'll crack cement and, and it, yeah, I wouldn't plant those. I wouldn't get those started. Okay. They'll probably crowd out most everything else that you plant. So, so I, I, I already purchased a, just a few. I just have a few lilies of the valley, the Rosa variety. Um, if I, so I have some areas where there's like on the edge where there are some other uh wildflower you know they're like of course lots of dandelions and then they're the, the i think they're not bluebells but they look like bluebells could i put lilies in the valley just in there on the side of the grass on the edge where the woods are and just let it spread along there is that a good idea uh, no no i would Should say I just no, throw it away <laughs> it will it will keep spreading i mean and you'll get it coming up over and through everything and if it goes into the woods and it will go into the woods, it's going to take over many of the plants there in the woods too. So as Lily of the Valley just basically something invasive? I would never plant. I would never yeah. plant. As much as I you love could the plant, plant you, know, you could you could put your Lily of the Valley in a container. Yeah. And grow it as a container plant. And then you, and then yeah. will it die in the winter? It's probably tough enough. You might want to put the pot or put the container in your unheated garage or something in okay. the winter, but um, yeah, you know, that's the best way if you can somehow contain it. If you have a little area that's completely surrounded by sidewalk, you probably could keep it in that area. 
Okay. Um, but it is, it, it spreads like wildfire and it's, it's very aggressive. And I, I, I like the flowers a lot, but I, oh, I do just, too. I pull a lot of it in my yard. Yeah. I have some already in um, an area by the house that it was planted when we moved here and I I'm trying to contain it. And I, every year I just, I have like a wall that I just dig it up and stop and then it doesn't get any further, but so I'll keep that out of there. Mm -hmm. So some wild geranium and some blood root. Now, the second area that I'd love to ask you about is um, it's about eight to 10 feet wide and about 80, 90 feet long. And I had strawberry plants there and I've since moved them and I'm going to do something else because the deer just chomped them and it wasn't sunny enough and all that. So it's sunny, but not super sunny. And I'm getting five service berry trees from the Arbor Foundation. And I really want to plant them in that space, kind of spread out and then native plants all around it. Um, does that see, sound like a good idea? When you say how, when you say it's kind of sunny, how much sun do you get? Well, there's sun on it most of the day. There's it's just a little bit dappled because there are some there's some a few trees. Most a lot of them were ash, and then now, they're you know the center the the, the trunk is there, but all the leaves are gone. It was sunny enough that I would get strawberries. I just had to fight with the bunnies and the deer so much. So I'd say three quarter sun. Okay. Okay. Well, I love service berry. I think it's one of the best native trees you can plant. It it has flowers in the spring. It has fruit. If you can beat the birds to the fruit, it's delicious, but the birds usually get there first. And then it has incredible fall color. So yes, I love service berry. I think that's a great, uh, a great choice. If you, if it's just lightly dappled sun, uh, shade, if you're getting shade most of the day, you could probably put some more sun-loving perennials in there, things like uh, black-eyed Susans, coneflowers. Um, I like to have people plant asters because they bloom late in the season um, when there's not a lot of other stuff flowering. And especially for the monarchs, when they're migrating, they need that nectar source late in the season. And mm -hmm. asters come in a lot of different shapes and sizes and colors. So you can get tall ones, shorter ones, white ones and, purple ones and some do well in do, shade you could do goldenrod but be careful of what goldenrod you do mm -hmm. because some mm -hmm. of them are very aggressive um, yeah. do you have a suggestion for one that's not too aggressive that would work in Door county well there's zigzag goldenrod that actually grows in quite a bit of shade and is not aggressive um what else showy goldenrod is relatively yes showy goldenrod is good there's stiff goldenrod though it that does tend to seed quite a bit but it can spread not, yeah yeah they, they tend to spread uh, spread quite a bit that's one thing that mm -hmm. i sometimes use some cultivars for <laughs> just mm -hmm. just because they aren't as aggressive but right they don't feel, and then feel quite the same ecological niche as as some of the other goldenrods so Sure. And mm -hmm. I was thinking of also, um, I of just throwing bee balm seed in there. Mm -hmm. I love bee balm. I just love it. Yes. And the, the hummingbird moths are one of my favorite oh, insects. Oh, they love so. that. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That is that wonderful work. advice. Thank you very much. Um, before we wrap up, is there anybody that you wanted to mention, a mentor to you or any kind of organization that you want to make sure people hear about in case I forget? Um, anything you want to mention? before we wrap up? Well, I definitely think we should mention wild ones. Wild, yes. if, if people haven't been haven't heard of wild ones before, they're probably thinking, what are these, just a bunch of tree huggers running around crazy in the woods. Uh, mm -hmm. Wild Ones is a national organization that is uh, dedicated to promoting the use of native plants in home landscapes. And the headquarters, the national headquarters is down in Nina, there is probably close to 60 chapters nationwide now. We have one for the Door Peninsula, uh, a chapter here. And um, they are a great source for information. As we were mentioning earlier on their website, they have uh, garden designs that you can download for free. You're getting a professional design using native plants for nothing. Um, so it's, and they have a lot of other information about monarchs and um you know, supporting pollinators and other insects. It's a great, great organization. So, and their and, website is really easy. It's wildones.org. And and we do put on the Door Peninsula Wild Ones along with Master Gardeners and Crossroads do sponsor programs that are free to the public and, and that talk about, you know, native plants or 
other information about pollinators and things. Mm -hmm. um, I mm -hmm. also think that Heather Holmes, um, her website, which is pollinatorsnativeplants.com, is an interesting one, especially if you have kids and you can download information from there. Um, and it's it's a pollinator thing. And I her books are also very good. So she would be someone, I think, that if people are interested in it, and, and like I said, if they have kids, she has a lot of interesting uh, little poster type things you can download and things. Yeah. Well, those sound great. Um, also, keep an eye out. It might take a little while, but keep an eye out for Chris's new book, The, Gar the Native Plant Rescuers. It's a mystery <laughs> set in Northeast Wisconsin about saving some of the, the most important plants from... Uh, uh, nefarious characters so when she gets it done <laughs> we'll we'll keep you informed and we'll let you know and don't forget and to did, come back go ahead chris okay i did want to say too that if people aren't as native plants we are selling quite a few of them for at the door county master gardener plant sale we have a mm -hmm. lot of natives this year and they're in smaller pots which make them easier to plant and they catch up pretty soon and and that so that would be a good source for one, you know, it's so a one day, two day kind of thing. The first day is a, a ticketed sale and then Saturday is a uh, open to the public sale. But um, that would be a good source for some native plants. But it's only, you know, those those two days on um, the 23rd and the 24th of May. Is that Memorial Day weekend? Yes, it is. Yes. Yeah, great. Yeah, and I was just going to mention that, and I also wanted to tell you that um, I will be going back out to uh, do part two of the Door County Master Gardeners preparation in the greenhouse, um, oh, and then yeah. I will be at the sale with my handy camera, asking lots of questions, and then afterwards, you know, I'll put together the whole um, video and share it on the Door County Gardening YouTube channel. So um, you can see that there. It's a great event, and I'm really looking forward to seeing all the wonderful work that these extraordinary gardeners, master gardeners, have done. So Chris and Karen, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Um, I can't tell you how grateful we are that you share your knowledge, that you've done all this work, that you've learned it, and that you're actually helping to transform Northeast Wisconsin, especially Door County, into a better place for for pollinators, for, for bees, for birds, for animals, and for us as humans. I greatly, greatly appreciate your wisdom and helping me with, with my endeavor into native plants. Uh, you're both lovely, wonderful people, and I hope I get to talk to you again soon. Hope so, Thank too. Thank you for having us. <laughs> Thank you. My pleasure. What wonderful people. Great gardeners, nice neighbors, and uh, willing to share all the things they've learned through all their experiences and years working with plants. Thank you very much to both of you again. And next week, just so you know, I'll have a short feature on one of my favorite birds, the cardinal. Um, at least once a month, I want to just thank these extraordinary animals that are part of our life. And uh, next week's Gratitude is for the Cardinal. It's a little bit more creative and a little bit more uh, vulnerable and honest. I hope you like it. And make sure to tell your friends and get out in the garden and enjoy this beautiful place that we live in, Door County. Thanks a lot. Until next time.